welcome everyone. I'm Heather Hebert, Editor-at-Large of Spaces Magazine, and today I'll be moderating um, our second virtual panel of 2022, uh, Spaces Outdoor Living. Um, if the last few years have taught us anything, it's that a sense of connection um, to nature, to the outdoors, to our community, to those that are closest to us are central to our sense of well-being. And as we've worked um, and uh, entertained and really utilized our residential spaces more, um, we've rediscovered uh, the joy of gathering outdoors, um, you know, and whether they're large or small, um, our outdoor spaces are really integral to our overall living space. Uh, providing us with a break from technology, um, a connection um, to nature, um, to the air, and to the um, and to the climate. We've also discovered um, that those spaces are fragile and that um, maintaining them sustainably is increasingly important and um, that landscape um, continues to evolve to address this. Today we'll discuss uh, the design of um, home and garden spaces uh, with five experts who have really elevated this practice to an art form. Um, our first speaker is Mike Lucas, co-founder of Lucas & Lucas Landscape Architecture, a boutique um, firm based in the town of Healdsburg in the wine country. Um, they specialize in the design of residential spaces um, that with an emphasis on the connection between home and garden architecture and landscape. And um, as an aside, um, their first book, Architectural Gardens, was just released this spring uh, by Princeton Architectural Press. And if you have not yet seen it, I highly recommend it. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Heather. It's good to be here. We'll load up a slideshow and talk a little bit about what we do. And certainly the value of outdoor spaces because that's our passion. And a video that led before here was uh, talked about basically how we view these spaces as, as a, an opportunity to interact with nature and their sculptural spaces, how we think about it. It's spatial, it's architectural and relating back to homes and the land, most importantly. Here's a shot of a <clears throat> some landscape on one of the properties we worked on. We have beautiful rolling hills up here, wonderful weather, and there's just so much to relate to and how to create comfortable spaces for people uh, is, is so important to get people outside or just looking through a window into the gardens or the beyond. So here's a hillside in the Santa Rosa area. And then this, this is the first garden I'll show you. There's the same tree and we did a pool. This is a destination, it's a larger property and <clears throat> located the swimming pool out in, in, a, in a distant part of the property to take advantage of the afternoon sun, the breezes, and just to have a place to get away from the home for restoration. And we've had the pleasure of spending a lot of time here, had been in a few parties and watched this place progress through the afternoon and into the evening and see the, the winds blowing through the grasses, the light, everything changing. And there, there certainly is a restorative quality here of being able to inhabit this space and the, and the formalization, a comfortable place to be and exist within, I would call this more stylized nature that then blends into the greater landscape but there's a safety there, people feel comfortable and you know, providing some seating places to exist, some shade, get out of the heat. And I think ultimately we're, we're pretty lazy too. We wanna, we wanna be somewhere comfortable, somewhere close to a house, a structure. So we build that into the landscapes and then also provide opportunities like this, the trails out into the meadow, places to get out there and really start to interact with the land. See these plants, grasses, perennials, and just experience the place from different locations. So people might wander off from a, from a party, have a look around. That's my wife and partner, Jennifer, out there, enjoying the landscape. And of course, get in the pool. My daughter, Flora, join this place. And some of our projects are on, on large properties as well, but the clients don't necessarily want as much landscape to maintain. This is a situation where we brought all the outdoor living really close and connected to the residents. This is the cover of our, our book as well. This, this image here just shows a big a wall. So it's a basically a wall courtyard with interior use spaces and the outside is, is a lower maintenance, more of a wild area. So here's the front door to the courtyard, which actually leads into the home. And there, there's coming in the door, stepping into this courtyard. 
a big reflecting pool and a walkway to the front. A real sublime space, it changes here too, it gets deeper, lusher greens. And up on the terrace, right off the main house, still looking at views beyond, editing out things that we don't want to see with the wall. There's a view to the north and some an outdoor dining area here, trellis that covers it for shade. And this is coming from the garage into the house, another view down through the courtyard. There's that trellis. The window's out too, just so the place didn't seem too enclosed and creating our own views within the space. We didn't have the big vistas to, to land on like in the, in the last project. Fire pit. And here, stepping back out, this is on the outside looking through, there's the fire. And then there's a, we did one big trail out into the back. We call it the back 40 out there as a water feature we did. And way out there is a, a bench to land on. Beautiful vignette. I'll jump into another product, another big rural product. Entries are massive for us. We, I love a, a great entry, which is just shows a progression. It's a, a place for people to get out of their cars, into their property, walk through the landscape. There's the home above, takes them to the front door. A nice fountain arrival. And another situation here, this one's nice in that it's all related to the house. This is in Sonoma, a big open flat area, not big grand views, but a lot of open sky. We remodeled an existing swimming pool, lounge chairs by the pool. And there's a peninsula use area up above. I'll show you that next. Just so, so you, you can see how these all interrelate, which is such an important part. The relationships, architectural, spatial, some shade here, brought in some massive olive trees fireplace at the end of the peninsula. The swimming pool is down here. There's a bocce court, which is pretty common here in wine country, off to the side. And that's a quieter, uh, more relaxed area down below too, a place to step off from the party once again, and trails again, heading out into the land. And here's just a good overview. There's the house, the pool, the trees, the fireplace and the bocce beyond. There's a lot of outdoor living right here too, a shade. So that's a very convenient place. It really encourages people to come out of the house, step out into the landscape without any issue whatsoever. I find these to be some of the most successful spaces for encouraging people outdoors. And a much more wild location here in the Santa Rosa mountains, peaceful spaces, beautiful trails through the woods some boulders we placed in a trail through these oaks. Brings you around to the back of the home where we perched a vanishing edge pool on the edge of this pretty steep hillside. Created use areas here. This is the, the back of the house main use areas, a few steps down to the, to the pool area. And then not blocking views, put the pool house down below here. But again, just these glorious trees really do so much of the work, the land is often it's right there for us. Uh, we just have to not mess it up ultimately. And I'll just have this be the last one so we can move on. But this is a, a garden in Sonoma with a big existing olive grove. And um, he just steps up to the front door. There was the, the passageway parking on the outside. And then within these existing olive trees, we, we took advantage of the shade. We can create big gravel areas, um, tables, that sort of thing. You can see the swimming pool in the front yard. It's an unusual situation. Parking blocked out below, outside of that hedge. And just moving in on that space. So Heather, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Um, what do I have to do here? Stop presenting. Thank you, Mike. You're welcome. Beautiful. Thank you, Heather. Um, 
our um, second speaker is Christian Douglas, the founder of Christian Douglas Design in um, Mill Valley in Marin County. Um, and Christian sees um, food as central to outdoor um, design and living. Um, and I'm so impressed with his work. We met about a year ago. Um, he integrates foods with uh, food uh, forward design with really highly stylized landscapes. And uh, his focus is on forming a healthier connection um, to the land and uh, healthier lifestyles um, and transforming the way that people live. So um, welcome, Kristen. Hi, Heather. Nice to see you. Mike, that was wonderful. I'm totally obsessed with your work. Can't wait to do some Q&A with you shortly. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Christian Douglas. I am the founder of Christian Douglas Design and the Backyard Farm Company. We are based just over the Golden Gate Bridge in Marin County, as Heather said. We are a multidisciplinary uh, design firm of landscape architects, landscape designers, and professional farmers. Uh, we have a mission to introduce more food and wildlife habitat into residential landscapes. Here is a, a uh, oh, actually, I have to slide this way. I just wanted to capture, show, oh, there's a delay here. Here's our amazing team. I wanted to capture everyone. This is post, uh, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. So we've got some of our uh, amazing designers and farmers in this team. They absolutely deserve a mention here as they do most of the heavy lifting on a daily basis. So food forward design so food has often been relegated to the far reaches of our residential landscapes um, i've been doing landscape for 25 years and typically what happens is food gets tucked behind a fence further away from the house where out of sight very quickly becomes out of mind and we as a team spend our days challenging that view and coming up with solutions to bring it further forward into our living spaces and what I want to do now over the next few minutes is really just to spotlight areas of some of the key principles that we focus on and how we approach um, garden design projects with food at the front. So here's a project we do in Napa. Uh, we did in Napa rather, this is St. Helena. Uh, sharing space is a huge one. And what I mean by that is often um, the sunny areas, particularly in smaller projects, um, the main landscape elements vie for the same space. Here we've, we have a fire pit, we have a pool, we actually have a dining area to the right, a small sort of bistro dining area to the right, right off of the house. So what we did here, we had to grow food, we wanted to grow food, so we actually ended up putting in a potager just to the left of the screen here. And um, now the homeowners basically have this beautiful kitchen garden right next to the pool, right next to the main activity recreation areas. So it gets a lot of engagement and, and as a result, a lot more success. So sharing spaces is really important and you can do it with food. Now proximity to house is one of our tenants. Uh, this is actually a front door to a cottage in Mill Valley um, that had a tricky hillside. And we turned this into a multi-terrace uh, kitchen garden area. Again, high activity, the children and parents come in and out of this door several times a day. They get greater exposure to food. They have become amazing gardeners from Black Thumb beginnings. Uh, we were fired actually after about two years um, into this project because they'd become so proficient at growing food. That is essentially how we measure success with, with our homeowners too. So proximity to house, if it's close to the house, you really need to elevate materials. So we do that a lot in this example of a, of a potager. We've added sculpture. We've added willow edging to the beds to add texture. Um, we've added espalier apples with uh, you know architectural lines up against a, a, a rather boring fence to the rear. And then we have more formal planting in the front and flowers, of course, for all of our pollinator species as well. So elevating materials is, is crucial if you're bringing it further forward. Um, the next point here is diversity. So thinking outside the vegetable box. Often people think of edible landscapes as vegetables. There are so many fruits, berries, herbs, tea species that we can grow as well. In this really small area here, uh, in a, in a, in a 5,000 square foot lot, we were able to put in at least a dozen perennial food species, as well as all of the flowering species. We have fruiting vines, we have fruit trees, berries, ground cover, and a few vegetables at the front. 
Um, so after diversity, activating challenging areas, this is a project we've been working on for several years with Chef Tyler Florence at his home in Corte Madeira, just around the corner. This was formerly an ivy bank full of rats next to the house. We transitioned it into a multi-terrace landscape. You'll see here on the right image, um, that's the house. That's actually the living room and the door breezeway that goes through to the kitchen. So again, bringing food forward, elevating materials. We've used uh, beautiful rock work, uh, willow edging again. And you can see on the left, there's a, a, a dining scene. This is often where the family and friends come and dine and spend time. It's become a, an amazing space to entertain. Um, probably my favorite, I'm going to wrap up a little bit here. Um, probably my favorite addition to all edible landscapes, thinking not just about annual foods and not just about your kitchen garden area, uh, but thinking about foraging. Here, Teddy um, was five years old when the pandemic hit. We had just finished their landscape. And um, he has now become a expert forager throughout his entire property. And he knows every single food that's growing in there now. And he happily helps himself to everything. And actually, this is one of the spaces. So this was a driveway, just a common standard in and out driveway. We transitioned to a, a regular formal entry. So it has a lot of the, the key components of, of a structured entryway with fountain, uh, structural planting with the boxwoods and grasses. Um, but we were able to add in and start to layer lots and lots of food species. This is also the sunniest place on the property. So we wanted to utilize sun, uh, going back to sharing. Um, and this also doubles as a pump track for the boys BMXs as well. So in this one area alone, we were able to not only create this gorgeous ornamental landscape, but we were able to add in all of these fruit species, these herb species, um, tea species, berries, trees, and we even have six hens at the rear and also two highs either side of the gate. So this is just an example of the work that we do and we're excited about. Um, we obviously don't have that much time to talk about it right now. We're doing the Q&A, but I'm happy to field more questions. Um, but this is something that we feel very excited about and see this as the future of landscape design, uh, particularly as we get into greater discussions with uh, food security, um, increasing increased prices of fossil fuels, et cetera, et cetera, and moving away from a more conventional agricultural system into a localized food system. Thanks very much. Wow. Thank you, Christian. That was great. Um, I got a little distracted reading all the all the tags on there. I want to go yeah, back. That was a lot. That was a lot. Um, our next uh, speaker is Jeff Hadley. Uh, he heads Hadley, Hadley General Contractors, um, a third generation construction firm based in Marin County um, with a deep history and legacy um, in our county. Um, for over five decades, the company's built a reputation for um, community leadership, stewardship, and uh, particularly a dedication to building homes that uh, capitalize on Marin's um, beauty, our weather, and um, our commitment to um, sustainability and healthy living. Um, welcome, Jeff. Great. Thank you so much, Heather. And um, thank you to all the viewers who are watching. And uh, thank you, Christian, Mike. Uh, what, what beautiful spaces you guys have created. Okay. Um, it's, it's really um, great to come on here and see uh, the beautiful designs because usually we come in after all the design work is done and uh, we get to see it come to life. Um, and on the flip side of the project, usually we're out of there um, when the landscapers and the landscape contractors take it over to really put the final touches. And I can speak from experience, um, a home without proper landscaping is, is really out of place and, and proper landscaping really makes it shine and look beautiful. Um, I'm going to share a few images. I'm going to briefly talk about the constructability side of, of these projects and how I feel that it's crucial that um, all the parties, being the professionals, whether it's architect, landscape architect, interior designer, um, designer, landscape contractor, building contractor, all should come together um, very early on in the project. I think it's to the client's best interest to have that done. Um, I always recommend clients find a team that they trust and they like working with. And uh, if everybody works collaboratively, it really brings the project uh, through the construction phase, the design phase um, into completion uh, very smoothly. And a, a holistic approach is critical. 
So I'll share some images um, of the work we've done and we'll we'll go through there, but I'll be talking mostly about um, kind of the un, the unseen parts of, of the work we do. Let me pull this up real quick. So, so this is an image of a home we did out in Stinson Beach. Um, and again, kudos to the photographer for uh, making the trip out uh, in the evening time to capture these beautiful images. Uh, th this, this home particularly started off as an older cabin style home. Um, a lot of small rooms, a lot of small windows and doors, really not capitalizing on the uh, beautiful views it has. It also had uh, a very small deck. Um, so we, we went in with the architect and very early on with the client were part of discussions of what could be done to the house structurally to really open up uh, the views. And um, we also pushed hard for a wraparound deck, which uh, the client really loved. And um, as we click through here, you can see uh, there's a lot of, excuse me here, click through, there's a lot of openings here in this house. And whenever you add a lot of glass or doors or openings into a structure, uh, you have to compensate with a, um, structural elements such as steel, steel frames up and over and back down, um, especially here in California where we're at in Marin County, we have a lot of seismic concerns. So um, the structural engineers really like to see a lot of compensation when we open the, open the walls up. And I bring that up mainly from a client perspective in the sense that uh, I think it's important to have these conversations early on in the project. Uh, it's always hard to see a client fall in love with the design um, with that is beautiful. But when it comes to pricing out the project, they realize that creating these large openings can really come quite expensive, uh, especially if it's a remodel where you have to go down through the foundation and um, you know, for lack of a, not a very technical term, but beef things up. Um, so that's why I really preach about uh, bringing a project team together to collaborate early on so that these discussions can be had and uh, really eliminate issues. For example, um, if the client wasn't able to afford all these, maybe you capitalize on the one large opening so you can really have that indoor outdoor feel and pulling that outdoor space in. And another reason I think is important to have good collaboration is, for example, the interior designer with how they lay out the room is really critical for how you use the space and you transition into the outdoor space. I mean, this is really common for what we see, these large openings, um, whether it's a multi-fold or a slide door, um, they're, they're becoming much more popular, not just on the luxury homes. Um, I'm seeing them um, often with uh, more modest projects as well. And I showed this image as well. This is one of our older projects, um, definitely before the, the phase or the trend of large openings. And I show it because it, it's an example of how you can much more cost effectively still open up the indoors and the outdoors together um, by using classic designs like French doors and large picture frame windows. So you still have a lot of glass, but you're not spanning as much of a space there. So um, it makes the structural elements a lot more simple to build. And if you're retrofitting an existing house, um, it can save a lot of money in the long run. Um, this is another example of a house in Stinson Beach, this time not on the hill, but actually down on the water. Um, and again, it, it incorporated elements of opening up doors. This house is mostly steel framed. Um, so there's a lot of steel elements in it. And this was also a new construction home. So when you're building new construction versus a remodel, you really do have a lot more flexibility and efficiency in creating these large openings, which I think provides overall value to the client. This is an example of a remodel, and I wish I had brought on a, a before picture because if you're standing in this room where you are, where this picture is taken, you'd be looking at a large brick chimney, um, which was really doing everybody a disservice and blocking this beautiful view of the San Francisco Bay. Um, so this was quite an extensive project adding in this door. This was the main element of the project. And um, we also did the kitchen there, but a significant amount of costs were sunk into um, creating additional structural elements to support this large span. Some of the other trends we're seeing, although I don't have uh, great pictures of them, are ADUs are becoming increasingly popular. Um, state of California specifically is really pushing for ADUs um, to help with the housing crisis. So that's a great way to start planning with your design team to incorporate ADUs into your outdoor spaces. Um, and we're seeing them not just be installed for um, ADUs, which is an accessory dwelling unit, 
Um, we're seeing them installed as uh, ADUs that can can be used in an accessory dwelling unit, but are often designed with the intent of maybe being a pool house or a guest house or an in-law unit. So there's a lot of flexibility, um, especially right now with the uh, the state law pushing for accessory dwelling units uh, to get something maybe in your backyard that could be used as a pool house or a gathering space for your kids and their friends or for you and your friends. So um, a lot of great things are happening in that sense. And again, I think that's why it's a great idea to have a collaborative approach very early on um, because you can talk about these things. This is another example of a remodel we did recently. Um, and it's an example I showed because it shows the contrast between the home with the large full opening versus a home with smaller French door openings. You still have a lot of glass and you can still really see the view, but this from a structural standpoint is much more simple to build than a full span opening. So it's, it's something that, again, if you start early on and you um, bring a contractor on board to you know, bounce ideas off of and, and talk about constructability of designs, you can really um, kind of, funnel in your approach of, of what the costs are and where you want to spend them. And if you save money on your doors and windows, you might be able to invest more in your landscaping and your outdoor spaces. Um, and again, another note towards interior designers um, and landscape architects as well, with how you lay out your furniture, uh, it can definitely make or break a space. So finding a team that works well together that you trust and that can really work collaboratively to uh, bring the project to fruition is I think in the client's best interest. I love this home. This home was um, simple by design, which does not mean simple by construction by any means. Um, if you notice, there's not a lot of trim, especially when we go into the interior images. Um, and that makes construction much more difficult because everything has to be exact and the tolerances have to be perfect. I also love this home too, because the, the landscaping is very, very simple, if anything uh, other than natural outside, but with our beautiful California poppies, it really makes the space um, um, glow for lack of a better term. And again, here you can see those trimless details, pivot doors, um, and a lot of details that the lack of detail actually creates a lot more work from a construction viewpoint. So again, something good to talk about early on in the project and, and where you wanna spend your money. Um, and this is just a picture of showing the, the open space and, and how the indoor and outdoor spaces really come together. Um, and then this is just a great little image of a, an outdoor space that looks back up uh, at, uh, you can't really see the peak, but up towards Mount Tam from Stinson Beach. And um, how a fun point about this one is because we were down in the beach and because Stinson Beach is on a septic system, um, Underneath this bocce ball court is an extensive leach field, which is not a fun, sexy word, but it's what gets rid of the water from the sewer waste. And um, it's a great way to show how you can incorporate landscaping and the necessity of the building departments to, uh, you know, yes, you need a large leach field, but no, it doesn't mean it's not a usable space. So again, bringing uh, the engineers and the designers and everybody together early on allows you to um, come up with solutions so you're not just looking at a big unusable space but you can actually access it and hidden underneath these benches is actually some of the utilities that uh, were necessary for the pumps on this leach field so um, again bringing everybody together coming up with solutions working with a team that you trust and um, can have a collaborative approach i think is key to these projects being successful especially when you get into the more complex and um, you know more aesthetically demanding projects so um, I'm happy, I'm looking forward to the questions and answer section and um, thank you for having me on and uh, thank you everybody again for your time. And at this point, I'll pass it back to uh, Heather. Thanks, Jeff. Um, next, we'll hear from Todd Venna, the um, maintenance operations director for Mariani Landscape, a company known throughout um, the Chicago area for its three generations of, of work and its iconic mint green trucks. Um, it's less known for its ongoing um, efforts to promote sustainable landscapes, um, but they are making a quiet, uh, quietly making a difference, not only in their own backyard, but sharing best practices um, with the rest of the landscape industry. Um, we're uh, very excited to have Todd here uh, to share uh, with us what's happening right now at Mariani. Welcome, Todd. Thank you, Heather. Hello, all. Uh, and I have to say, beautiful work, Mike, Christian, and Jeff. 
very impressive. Um, as Heather mentioned, I am Todd Vena. I'm the Director of Maintenance Operations for Mary Island Landscape, and I've been with the company for 21 years. Um, I'm going to walk you through our presentation today. First, just a little background on who we are. Um, we perform extensive design, build, and maintenance work, primarily for our residential clientele along the North Shore and greater Chicagoland area, as well as Wisconsin, Michigan, and some of the surrounding Midwestern states. We have a full uh, design and landscape architecture team that works out of our design studio. We have a team of craftsmen that install um, the, our build projects. And then finally, what I'm here to focus on today is the caretaking and the maintenance we perform and how sustainability and innovation tie in. Um, just a little brief snip of what I do. I'm responsible for all aspects that pertain to the maintenance production team uh, for our roughly 1,800 maintenance clients in the Chicago land market. Um, you know, what I, the goal of what I hope to share today is uh, as the world changes and it seems to be faster and faster each day, um, Mary Island Landscape is constantly innovating and changing the way we work as well. Uh, I will give you some ideas of some of the things we're doing here and a peek behind the curtain of the Mariani production team, so to speak. So, um, you know, bottom line, we want to be good stewards of the planet for numerous reasons, um, but to name a few, we know it's not enough to create and maintain beautiful properties for our clients. We have to do everything we can to make our world a better place. Uh, it's what our clients want as well. Our client representatives stay in constant contact with our clients. So we know what they want from us and what they're thinking. We all know here our clients are very intelligent people and we can benefit from learning what they know and we all get smarter and it's a win-win. Um, in many cases, it is our obligation to comply with the communities where we work uh, and it's the right thing to do. So let's talk a little bit about innovation and how it's ingrained in our DNA here. Um, we are early adapters we do like to innovate to find better, faster, more efficient ways to work, um, but there's a caveat to that. However, as much as some people might want us to implement new technology and practices, innovation has to be a gradual process. Uh, we have to implement the right equipment, make the right choices. Uh, technology is consist consistently changing at a rapid rate, um, and there's always trade-offs, cost, uh, availability, uh, ease of use, the optics of organic versus non-organic, et cetera. Um, innovation takes constant evaluation to determine what's effective, compliant, and affordable. I'll touch on some of the examples of what we're doing here. Uh, the first example you see here is uh, generation one electric mowers. Uh, we started using electric mowers, blowers, trimmers, and edgers uh, about 2015. Uh, and since then, we've incorporated them into our work. Uh, we have a local college here uh, with major acreage where we maintain the grounds of two of their campuses with all electric, a whole, the whole crew is electric. Uh, they wanted a quieter presence and a less of a distraction. So we uh, met their needs and met the expectations of the professors, students, and the sustainability committee. Next, we brought on the Husqvarna automower. Um, we tested this innovation and product uh, and brought it on board in 2017. It's a fully robotic, electronic, autonomous lawn mowing, zero emissions, um, and it's almost completely silent. Uh, it's better for the lawn, horticulturally speaking. It mows the lawn every day, cutting continuously, creating shorter clippings that can be broken down, return nutrients back into the lawn, uh, unlike traditional weekly mowing where the clippings are long and need to be collected because they will not break down. Um, in addition, since the mowers are specific to a site, we have less disease 
uh, spread from site to site. Uh, our fleet of automowers like this one here uh, for our maintenance clients is growing quickly with hundreds over four Midwestern states. Next, we'll touch on some of the innovations with products that we're using. Um, we've made advances in our fertilization program. We've researched and for the past six seasons have offered the latest and controlled release fertilizer technology. Um, the controlled release of nutrients into the lawn is based on temperature. As the temperatures rise, small amounts of nutrients are slowly released. Uh, it's a twice a year application, so there's less leaching, uh, less runoff, no spikes in grass growth, and less traveling to and from jobs. And with that, I will send it back to Heather. Thank you. Um, our final panelist today is Natalia Ospina, um, Director of Health, Equity, and Nature for the Brushwood Center at Ryerson Woods, um, a nonprofit committed to promoting the health of people and communities by connecting um, them with art and nature, building bridges in essence, um, particularly uh, for uh, disadvantaged communities. Um, they bring in over 250 artists every year um, to deepen the public's connection with nature. Um, welcome, Natalia. Thank you so much, everybody, and so excited to present for you all. So I work for Brushwood Center, and we are a small nonprofit that basically our mission is to inspire creativity and well-being through nature and the arts. And so we're talking today about the outdoors, and today I'm going to really focus on talking about making the outdoors accessible to all. As we've all seen through the pandemic, we've really taken refuge in, you know, being outside in our backyards or in the woods, whatever way that you want to access the outdoors. And so my role through Brushwood is really to connect people to the outdoors as well as connecting public health into this component of our mission. And so kind of a pretty dark but very realistic statistic and very i think prevalent in what's going on in the world is that the life the average life expectancy of residents in north chicago is 14 years less than that of lake forest residents so that's just within a five mile radius and this is not unique to lake county this happens everywhere across the united states and so really just taking a second to think about that statistic and just defining that where you live should not define where, how your, your outcomes of health should be. So there are five super fun sites in Lake County. And so really thinking about these inequities and that's kind of where my role comes in. So we really believe that there are vital conditions for well-being and justice. And so these are some of the things that we believe. I know in the previous presentation, we talked a little bit about stewardship. And so we also believe that we should all be good stewards of our land. And so just having these needs of a thriving natural world, basic needs, human housing, lifelong learning, reliable transportation are all things that we value and are trying to make sure that people do not have these barriers to accessing the outdoors. And so a lot of the root of our work is through our partnerships and collaborations with 70 community organizations throughout the Chicagoland area. So we really believe that community care is at the root of our work and defines us and really makes us unique because we're bringing community voices to all of the work that we're doing. And this kind of started to frame what is now an accelerator that we just launched in the last year. So it's a health equity and nature accelerator. So really incentivizing the collaboration between healthcare and the environmental sector. So a little bit about me, I've worked in public health for the last 10 years and also have this love for the outdoors and started to notice that there weren't really spaces where people were talking about outdoor equity as well as healthcare. And so it seemed like a very natural fit to come to Brushwood who was trying to really break down these systemic barriers to improve health outcomes uh, that are linked to the climate crisis 
as well as to hopefully access nature to people who may not have the opportunity to access nature on a regular basis. And so there's kind of three main components to this accelerator. And so the first one is data. So we all have this, or we all have this preconceived notion that being outside is good for us, whether mentally or physically, but where are the actual numbers? So we're creating a tangible report that hopefully will drive investment. And then we will hopefully get to pilot this by creating some sort of pilot program using community-driven data to prove this hypothesis that being outside is good for you. So an example that I've been giving is if you go on a walk once a week and you do this consistently for three months, what is going to change and what health health indicators are going to change? So looking at things like diabetes indicators or blood pressure. And so really proving this hypothesis. And then also we want to create capacity for healthcare providers as well as use technology platforms to really provide information and empower people who are working in the healthcare field to take people outside or either provide their patients with the resources and the capacities that they need and the knowledge that they need to go outside. And so these are the three things that we're really focusing on. And that is it for me. I'm happy to answer any questions and thank you all for having me. Thank you, Natalia. Um, such great work. Um, I think we're bringing everybody back now um, so we can all talk together. Everybody's starting to come online. Hi, everyone. There we go. How is everybody? Uh, wonderful presentations. Thank you so much. Um, so many things to ask. Um, I, two things that I noticed that came up, um, you know, health, wellness, well-being, well, way more than two. Okay, I've already listed three. <laughs> health, wellness, well-being, and um, sustainability. Um, each of you touched on this, um, and then working together to make these things happen, whether it was, you know, Hadley Construction bringing the team together to make sure that people can get what they want, um, you know, Christian uh, bringing in, the, you know, food and integrated lifestyle into the landscape, Um um, and then, you know, Todd talking about uh, sustainably maintaining those landscapes, which I think is super interesting. Um, so actually, my first question is for Todd. Um, you talked about, um, uh, you know, the things that you're doing to sustainably maintain landscapes. Now, we're... Um, uh, Mike, Christian, and I are in, and Jeff are in, um, are in California. So what can we do here to be better stewards? Um, I think one thing you can do is as your traditional equipment ages, uh, look to electric as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, managing and monitoring irrigation. I know out there it's a, a necessity, um, but here we're able to really manage it and monitor it well and use it as needed um and plant plant material i think you know as plants live and die we need to replace them and continue to put back uh what you know goes away which i think we're all on board with mm -hmm. um and then um on the topic of sustainability jeff you and i talked um a couple of weeks ago when we first connected um, about water specifically. And I know this is something that we all deal with, especially Mike and Christian here in California, um, um, is uh, you told me, and I would love for you to just briefly touch, I know we don't have pictures, but um, about some innovative solutions to water storage. And there was one project in particular. Can you share that with us? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously here in California, um, we, we love our rain whenever we get it. <laughs> and, uh, Not often enough. Water. Um, so I think there's, there's several approaches to water sustainability uh, in California and specifically with the new projects we're seeing and also with um, remodels, the installation of um, either gray water systems that, that harness some of the water coming through the house itself capturing on site and also rainwater storage systems. Um, the project I mentioned to you uh, the other week was uh, is a project down in Portola Valley uh, on the peninsula. And um, it's a new construction home, a, a very large home. And the 
client, and this is something that really resonated from Todd's uh, presentation as well. He's absolutely right. Our clients are smart. They're innovative people. Um, and, and they want, usually people want to be good stewards, which is fantastic. That's how it should be. I um, mean, this client falls into all those categories. He's very smart. He's very intelligent and he wants to be a good steward. And so he's investing in his own property to install a very large, um, upwards of 120,000 gallon water storage tank, um, underground on his property. And that's something that, you know, the, the average homeowner probably doesn't have the means to do, but, um, I think there's a, you know, definitely certain scales that you can do uh, capturing water on site to uh, use for irrigation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure some of the other guys could talk about uh, as well is, you know, is that water needing to be treated? What, what is the right thing to capture? What's not right? What's the right amount to invest in that? Um, but it's great to see. Uh, I've seen several clients in the last few years really want to get on board with that, whether it's during a remodel and working with the plumbing um, because it's only certain fixtures you can pull water from for storage or if it's working with roof areas, drainage on site, plumbing for um, water storage on site uh, for rainwater collection. So it's great to see. It. It's really exciting. Um, I'm really into the sustainability aspect as well. Um, so I'm really excited to see. And then one more quick note is on that property down in Portola Valley, he's not only installing a water storage tank, but he's uh, installing a full fire suppression system on the property. So that that water storage oh, yeah. not only will be sustainable for storing it, but it also could go to good use and protection of his property as well. So it's great to see clients investing in that kind of fun, sustainable um, work. Um, on the topic of sustainability, um, Mike, uh, you uh, one of the things I love most about about your practice is your your meadows um, and <clears throat> the relationship between. Um, the line between the built landscape and then the landscape that exists. Um, and there are a lot of, um, gra you know, grasses and uh, hardier plants that you integrate. You have the agave, I know. And is, uh, is your practice shifting somewhat as, as water becomes a, an issue? I know we've talked about this before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know about the uh, sustainability part as much as the beauty and, uh, sculptural aspects of what we do and we do in these bigger projects so it's it's something that I'm thinking about and, and I'm I guess I'm a little slow to change but it's definitely being dictated now with these droughts that uh, the amount of plants we're using needs to be cut back um, even though they are relatively drought tolerant it's still just the the volume of what we were showing on some of the earlier projects mm -hmm. you know pretty extensive landscape so that's that's what I'm working with and, and then fire challenges as well bring vegetation close to homes there's there's some I'm a little slow to adapt, uh, admittedly, and but it is on the radar. And but those grasses, the meadows, those tend to be lower water using compared to a lawn. But it's still just the sheer volume of it. So I think the the courtyard project I showed just kind of reining things in a little closer to the home and not yeah. having such an extensive space is actually mm -hmm. probably the most sustainable approach mm -hmm. that we can take. Um, and of course, the low water using plants. And then on the, I think the gray water systems too are, are a great opportunity. You feel a little bit better about taking a longer shower as long as that water is going out into the garden. And that's something we do every day. It doesn't rain here every day. So the, you know, holding that water on site, once you collect it, I mean, some of these cisterns can be dry already at this point in the year. And then it's dry for a longer period of time. You know, are those systems, do you think uh, the, the price, the cost of those coming down? Do we know? I don't, I don't yeah. have to speak to that. I don't, I mean, a, a particularly below ground is uh, going to cost a bit more than above ground tanks. Sure. So. Sure. I guess we look to Australia for an example. Um, yeah. we, they're sort of industry leaders in that. And uh, I had a question for um, Christian. Um, mm -hmm. it, uh, it, it came to mind as Natalia was talking about mm -hmm. equity and health equity. And mm -hmm. it, it came to me that, and this is just, totally off the cuff. We didn't talk about this before, but um, that your approach to food forward design is, is so perfectly suited to her mission, mm -hmm. um, whether it's with, whether it's in urban conditions or uh, multifamily housing projects or mm -hmm. communities at risk. Um, have you, have you interacted or thought about, thought about uh, that your mission in that way? Yeah. Yes. Actually the, the the genesis of the business actually was much more environmentally and people forward. I had to package it into ornamental landscape model because 
people just were not biting and taking it. So actually underneath the root of everything we do is all about, um, it's, it's activism actually is what we're doing, but it's just dressed prettily into ornamental landscape. So it's, mm -hmm. it's about our local food system. It's about connecting people with food. It's mm -hmm. about providing more yeah, security, a local, local food economy, local, local food system. Um, and just yeah, having more engagement, getting people outdoors as, as designers, landscape designers, we're always taught uh, or a lot of our goal is to get people outdoors to engage with the landscapes that we create for them. Well, I, I have yet to meet one element within a landscape palette um, more engaging than food. Um, and we've seen that time and time again. Um, and we're witnessing that with our farm company um, and our designers. And so that in of itself is, uh, as, as we talk about equity and we talk about um, health and well-being, um, particularly in a smaller residential landscape, I think this has to be a, a kind of gateway for people to 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 hit those points and to and to get healthier um, through engagement and just through and uh, through enjoyment and fun and that's how how we try and and do it here and that's why we have the backyard farm company to steward and train and mentor people to take it from the right. installed landscape all the way through to gaining confidence themselves. Yeah, Natalia, do you? Um... You had mentioned um, briefly that some of the communities you serve and some of the projects, did you have some, do you, have you, uh, I guess, can you go a little bit deeper into some of the um, pro programs that you have? I know specifically around art. Yeah, um, so we do quite a lot at Brushwood. So we actually sit on 500 acres of land and our nonprofit is in an old historic building. Mm -hmm. And so we're a separate entity from the nature preserve from the forest preserve, but we have a gallery that rotates every six to eight weeks. So different local artists are showcased there. We also have art classes as well as we have a huge veterans program. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, and we also have an art, uh, a music director, so we'll have some musical events as well. So it is kind of this gathering place where we are doing, we're really just trying to get people outside, whether it is at Brushwood or locally in the neighborhood. And you talked about the health benefits. Did you want to expand on that at all? The health benefits specifically of being outside? Yeah, so... We all need vitamin D. So being outside obviously increases our vitamin D. But I think like for me personally, it just has changed. I have a chronic illness and I have seen the impacts of being outside and becoming a runner and a climber and it really changing the way that I live my life and my chronic illness and not flaring. But I think that that you know, is something that everybody can have. I think if you talk to anybody in the pandemic, everybody really loved walks and that's just no coincidence. Like being outside does mentally make you feel good. So I think there's a lot to it. Um, and I think that's why we're really trying to prove this hypothesis so we can have that concrete data of saying more than just, you know, it's good for us, but how, like what health indicators are really, you know, are we trying to really get at through physical and mental well-being from being outside. Right. And then the data helps. Exactly. Support, right. Yep. Driving the investment. Exactly. Um, it's really quite amazing the connections between the different, you know, we have the high-end homes and then we have the need in um, lesser served communities and how the idea is really kind of knit together. Yeah. It's you like know, the same just, idea. Just yeah. What Christian communities. is doing and, um, and then also yeah, what, what Todd is doing in, you know, maintaining the large, you know, the university um, uh, landscapes um, and traditionally universities, right, are are pretty forward thinking and uh, focused on um, on, um, you know, adopting uh, early adopters, I guess you would say. Right. Um, so, Todd, when you're working with the universities, was there anything else that you um, adopted from your discussions with them, particularly? As I'm thinking about the, we're talking about public sphere and I mean, we started out talking about residential landscapes, but it's, it's really both. Yeah. I mean, one thing internally that we are going to have to design out and we're working on it now is as we, as this type of equipment scales up uh, in the future and it becomes more utilized on the residential side, we have to uh, put on the, the infrastructure to support it. Um, the equipment we use at the college 
has to charge overnight uh, for us to be able to use, utilize it the next day. It does run all day, um, but we've had we have to bring it in, plug it in, uh, and let it charge. So we're looking at uh, all of our maintenance crews pull a trailer. So we're working with our trailer manufacturer to outfit it with, you know, a charging unit, uh, a converter. So basically the trailer would be treated as an RV, essentially, where at the end of the day, the crew plugs the whole trailer in, and the trailer ch is a charging unit. Um, it's, you know, it's costly and we're designing it ourselves with our, our partner. Um, so we hope to be on the, the forefront of that. Right. Um, so much of what we talk about is, you know, scalability, right? We've got big ideas, big, you know, big landscapes and, you know, translating them into small landscapes or, or, or vice versa. Um, so that's, that's a pretty interesting way to, to look at it. Um, Mike, I wanted to ask you, this is a little bit off topic, but um, uh, in reading your book, you had uh, you include 11 design lessons and mm -hmm. they're particular to, to the landscapes that you've designed in the wine country. Um, do you want to share a few with us? Cause I think they're boy, so boy. cool. Can I remember any of them? Well, you, okay. Here's a few. Yeah. Cause I remember because I, I just looked <laughs> through you. it. Um, one is, is, is to create a sense of journey through the landscape. That was one. And that mm -hmm. seems to be common to, to what we're all trying to ach achieve, right? Um, it's sort of a narrative through the landscape. And another was saving what's there, particularly in California, that's oak trees. Um, and, it, you know, are there, um, and uh, those two st step out. I mean, I'm a huge fan. Yeah. I grew up in California, so I'm a huge fan of our native oak trees. Um, and, you know, is there is there something to that in terms of, uh, you know, turning back somewhat to our native our native landscape and, and promoting? Because I know that the paths that you create through the mm -hmm. your constructed landscapes then go off into the non-constructed landscapes. So is, it, is there a right. lesson there for us to to strengthen those, you know, those connections between the constructed and then draw people out into not what's so planned, but out, out into, and that could be translatable to both the large residential projects that you work on. And then some of the spaces that say Natalia is uh, working with. Um, well, one that I like too, that is one of the lessons I recall is, um, is the site analysis, spending time on a property. There's a lot of editing that we do, you know, analyzing reviews, wind, air, how, how things are just laid out. So to best take advantage of what a property has it, on bigger properties, that's really important. It's it, in the smaller properties. It's you're basically creating the, the views. I showed that courtyard. So, um, I think it is. Yeah, those inherent inheritant uh, characteristics of any property, even if it is a backyard, it's just is analyzing the, the light. Um, you're thinking about how shade's going to happen. So, um, I think that that's a big part that kind of builds up of what you're talking about. Right. Um, and, uh, Jeff, we had talked about, um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we, we had talked, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about, um, about ADUs because that literally is building in the garden and you touched on that a little bit, but, um, you were talking about a lot of things and I wanted to kind of circle back to that to, um, have you seen, um, an increase in that because that's that's quite fascinating because it's it's kind of what we're doing with all of these conversations is 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 weaving things together. There's a need for housing. There's a need for space. Um, there's a need for connecting to nature. Are you seeing people um, uh, utilizing these in new ways and you know asking for them asking for ADUs in with more frequency? We've definitely seen an uptick in ADUs, um, at least here in Marin County. I couldn't speak for the state uh, mm -hmm. overall, but I, I think the main reason for that, to be perfectly honest, is that the some of the roadblocks and the hoops you have to jump through to get things approved have uh, significantly decreased uh, be, because the state is kind of opening the floodgates on approving. They want ADUs. They want more housing. So they're, they're, they're lowering the roadblocks to get that approved mm -hmm. as far as planning goes. 
Um, and yeah, I think again, it can be used for many different uses, um, given the family that's installing it. And then one thing you and I touched upon early on is the, uh, the, the importance of planning ahead. You know, if, if you think you may want an ADU in the future and you're doing a large remodel or a large mm -hmm. landscaping project, now is the time to run the, the gas, the electrical, the water lines to that location. Um, everything's open. If you have a large concrete patio or stone patio or, or landscaped area, coming back in 10 years or five years to run those lines is significantly more expensive than running them now when you have the ground open and um, can, can run them you know, somewhat easily, yeah. even if you just use a sleeve instead yeah. of a, a, the actual pipe. So I know we're short on time, but um, that's, that all goes back to the, the holistic planning and collaborative approach, in my opinion, you know, think, think ahead mm -hmm. and implement what you can now to save money later. Well said. Thank you. Yeah. Well put. Um, we do have, um, we're, we're, we just have a little bit of time, but we have one question from the audience uh, for Mike. Um, and it says, do you typically incorporate outdoor lighting into your beautiful landscapes? <clears throat> I oh, like we that do beautiful landscapes. Yes, thank you. That's a good question. Uh, we haven't photographed the night lighting, uh, but we do indeed. Uh, getting We basically have a safety level of lighting just to get people around in the outdoors. Oftentimes, they'll be out there and it does start to get dark. So getting back to the home, lighting stairs, that sort of thing, just so there's basically circulation is uh, visible and not mm -hmm. overlit. And then the next level would be more into the accent lighting just to mm -hmm. maybe uh, highlight an oak tree, give people something to look at, particularly out in these rural areas where it's quite dark at night and there's nothing to see. So it, it just gives you something to look at and, and creates a quite a bit of drama and theater. And it varies depending on the client too. Some people want, want it all lit up and I prefer kind of a more moderate approach, mm -hmm. softer lighting. And now with these LED lights that are coming out too, and they have some warmer tones and just the, the longevity of, um, yeah, that helps. Bulbs. It really does help. It doesn't take so much power. So it's um, makes it a bit more accessible in that way. But yeah. It's yeah. a nice part of landscaping. And it's typically something we think about towards the end. Or there's the architecture and we move into you know, lighting planning. But that is an important part. It can be integrated into walls, um, stairs, that sort of thing as well. So it doesn't need to be considered as part of the architecture. Mm -hmm. Do you have to think about, um, I read an article in um, the Atlantic Monthly just yesterday, um, about uh light pollution do you have to do you have to think about that at all do you do you focus this you know a lot of the lighting downward and keep it low and yeah it's mandated in some communities uh here in Hillsburg it is like that um so they don't want any up lighting they don't enforce that law but I, I try to honor it and thinking particularly for up lighting a deciduous tree in the winter time what that's going to look like it's just shining light straight up into the sky sure and our neighbors, yeah, we've had two new lighting projects go in in the last year, and it has changed the stargazing from our yard, I have to say. And we don't have any lights yet in our yard. Maybe a couple, oh. but it's pretty dark. Haven't stargazing. gotten that yet. Stargazing yeah. is another very important way to connect to nature, right? And, and um, well, thank you all so much for being here. I think we're at the end of our time. Um, I really appreciate all of you joining me and um, being so candid and all of your work is uh, beautiful and uh, really important. And uh, we appreciate you. Thanks, Heather. So thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. thank you. And thank you, the viewers, too. Yeah, thank yeah. you.